Hello and welcome to Silver Age, Silver Screen, a podcast where we watch, discuss, and review sci-fi, cult, superhero, and other stereotypically geeky films. I'm your co-host, Casey Jarms. And I'm your other co-host, Riley Thorpe. Two weeks ago, two weeks, yeah? Yeah, two weeks ago, we watched this great, very famous film named Zardoz. And, I mean, everyone's heard of Zardoz. Everyone knows that it stars Sean Connery as Ed. But apparently, we did a little digging, and it turns out back in 1962, uh, apparently Sean Connery had another film role in something called James Bond, Dr. No. I'd never heard of it before, but apparently it's well received i'd heard a little bit I, i'd heard of it you know but like i don't know i never really thought it had that big of a cult following to like actually seek out and watch the movie you know yeah yeah this is a very obscure cult film jokes aside we watched the first james bond film very famous series it's what 25th yeah. film to be out soon allegedly with covid we don't know but 25th film no time to die is allegedly going to be coming out at some point this year and while we're waiting it's bankrupting mgm so yeah yeah who knows if that iconic film production studio that has been around for what almost 100 years over 100 years who knows if that company's still going to be around next year because of this one movie but you know we're waiting. Hey, on the bright side, MGM's already been half dead for like 20 years at this point. Very true. This came out in 1962. It's at this point the oldest film we've watched. Directed by Terrence Young, an adaptation of one of the James Bond novels by Ian Fleming. Although not the first one. I'm pretty sure Dr. No is like the fourth book. It's the sixth, actually. Oh, geez, that's even weirder. Casino Royale is the first one, and... That was used to launch the uh, Daniel Craig Bond series. And uh, it was also featured in a CBS show called Climax. It was a live recording of an episode. And it was about Casino Royale, the story of James Bond. James Bond being played by Barry Nelson. So technically, that was the first iteration of James Bond we ever got. This shitty, cheap live recording of a CBS show. But it wasn't until many years later that we finally got a feature film based on Ian Fleming. Fleming's novel. And strangely enough, they actually didn't go with the first film in the series. They went with the sixth and kind of told the stories out of order. Although, to be fair, James Bond does kind of lend himself to that. The James Bond novels, I've never read them from what I know. They're very much an anthology about this character. Mm -hmm. And really, based on what I've read about reception at the time, that's this film's greatest strength that it introduced the world to the premier British spy, Bond. James Bond. James Bond has been played by a host of other actors. Roger Moore, Daniel Craig, as we mentioned, Timothy Dalton, Pierce Brosnan. That one dude who was only in one movie. Yeah, that people say is like one of the best Bond movies ever made. That no one knows because he only played Bond in one movie. In this film, James Bond is played by the iconic Scottish actor Sean Connery, who recently, this last year, passed away at age, what, 92, I think? Something like that. He had a big legacy that included James Bond and Zardoz. So, you know, it was a little mixed, but, you know. <laughs> so, let's just jump right in to the plot of this film. First off, the title sequence, it opens up with the iconic turn to the camera, shoot it, blood drips down, and the theme with all the trumpets starts playing. Very nice. Although weird because James Bond is wearing a hat in this version for some reason. Yeah, you know, when they filmed that barrel shot, A, it was filmed with a micro lens and shot inside an actual barrel of a gun wait seriously that seems excessive but also really interesting i think it was just the barrel though so it like wasn't an actual like legit gun you know i mean i would have assumed they used a cardboard cutout yeah that probably would have been best and they probably did that on lighter ones yeah but 
when it comes to that shot, the reason why he's wearing a hat is because that is not Sean Connery. That's actually Sean Connery's stuntman. And if you look at that footage, when he shoots the gun, it's kind of grainy. It's not the highest quality. They purposefully did that because if the quality was too high, you would be able to tell that that's not Sean Connery. So the James Bond theme is playing. We're getting all these actors' names. And then it switches to the song Three Blind Mice. Yeah. And the film starts up with this cold opening of a trio of blind men in Jamaica walking down the road. <laughs> Which is, that like threw me for a loop. Like, what the f did not see that coming. This film is a lot different than what I personally was expecting because I don't know about you, but I am a fan of the James Bond franchise, but I admit I have not seen even close to a majority of the films. I think including this one, this was the fifth of 25 James Bond movies that I've seen. Now I've seen Dr. No, GoldenEye, Casino Royale, Quantum of Solace, and Skyfall. So obviously most of the ones I've seen are within the last like 20, 25 years or so. So, but that was something that threw me for a bit of a loop, just how much the franchise had changed. This franchise is going on 60 years old. In like two years, it's going to be 60 years old. It struck me for a loop how much the franchise has changed. Even especially, I thought it was very interesting how this film takes place almost entirely in Jamaica, which I thought was a pretty unique and interesting setting for a James Bond story. Again, like, what the hell? On the other hand, there's me, who, as I stated last time, this is the first time I've ever seen a James Bond movie. All what I know is, I mean, it's a famous franchise. I know all the tropes. And from what I can tell, this is very subdued for a James Bond movie. Like, there are no gadgets. The climax is very subdued. There are, of course, things you'd associate with James Bond, which we'll get into. But yeah, this movie is very interesting. Very unlike anything that I personally have seen with James Bond. And granted, that said, most of the stuff I've seen of this franchise is quite recently, at least in comparison to this. So I'm glad I was able to see it and review it so that I can learn more about this franchise. After our whiplash three blind mice scene, the film cuts to a group of British men in Jamaica who are having lunch together, playing cards, talking. One of them has to leave to go do some business things, and as he's going to his car, he goes past these three blind men, and then they just murder him, because they're actually assassins. Then it cuts to his house, where his secretary is calling to England to do a daily check-in, and then the assassins show up, kill her too, Go through their files, steal one Mark Dr. No, and cold open over. Time to introduce our protagonist. There was one thing I did notice about this film, especially in that scene in particular. Some of the editing is a little janky at times. Like, when the men are killing the secretary, it's like she's standing in one position, and then immediately it'll... In that same shot, she'll be standing in a different one, and it's like, okay, that was a weird editing choice. There's not much of that throughout the movie, though I will say the editing in this film is not entirely always the greatest. You know? MI6, after the line goes dead, decides that they need to send their best agent to Jamaica to find out what happened. And we are introduced to James Bond. He's in a wealthy club playing Baccarat, which is that one card game that the only reason people ever talk about it is in relation to James Bond. <laughs> and while he's playing this game, he gives the iconic line. He introduces himself as Bond. James Bond, and he hits on the woman he's playing against because because he's Bond James Bond. We'll get into this, but <laughs> Sean Connery is very horny in this movie. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's one thing that carries over from Zardoz. We keep talking about Zardoz, which if you haven't seen that, or 
well, listen to that review. It's a very obscure movie that starred Sean Connery that we watched a few weeks ago. That's very weird and not very good. And we're going to keep making references to it because I can't watch Sean Connery without thinking of that weird, weird kind of rapey film. That said, Sean Connery does do a really great job as James Bond. He is very handsome. He is 32 at the time of the filming. So he was in peak physical condition. He was menacing in, in action sequences, though limited those scenes may be. Funny thing about that, he does do a great job physically from an acting perspective. There's a reason why this role became so iconic is because Sean Connery did such a great job. Funny thing, like I said, Sean Connery was... 32 when they filmed this movie and when it came out he had started going bald at age 19 however so for this film and the sequel from russia with love the balding wasn't so bad to the point where he had to wear a toupee they were able to put some makeup on it and cover it up to make it convincing however by the third film in the franchise goldfinger the balding had progressed so much he had to wear a toupee and for the rest of the f series he did like what three or four more bond movies after that including goldfinger he wears a toupee for over half this franchise huh i never knew that and also that shows how old this film is because if the actor started going bald right before the first action movie in modern days the filmmakers would be like woohoo because all the action stars are bald now dwayne johnson vin diesel bruce willis yeah a representative from MI6 tracks Bond down, goes to the club, hands one of the workers there his card, tell him it's an emergency. The worker hands Bond a card, and he realizes, he's like, alright, this is something serious, I need to leave. But before he does that, he asks out the incredibly beautiful Miss French, I believe her name was, to a golf date that next afternoon. He's got some moves, you know, he's James Bond, what do you expect? Then he goes to the headquarters of MI6 to meet with M, basically his boss, the person who sends him on his assignments. And then he walks into the office, but he flirts with the secretary a lot. And that's the other thing about James Bond in general is this is very clearly pre Me Too movement. A few decades pre, yeah. I'm not, I mean, not trying to get into it very much, but James Bond would have gotten his ass canceled a long time ago. <laughs> if... To be fair, he doesn't do anything really creepy in this movie. It's just right. amazing. Holy shit. Stop being horny for five seconds. You are investigating murders, man. Stop hitting on every woman you run into. Dude, priority. Priorities. Priorities, Priorities. My guy. <laughs> Also, in the scene where James Bond is talking to his boss, M, we get our Q scene, and I'd heard about these before watching these films. Like, oh yeah, every James Bond movie has a scene where the scientist Q comes in, and he gives James Bond his gadget that he'll use in the film. First off, Q isn't actually called Q in this one, which is weird, but the gadget that Q gives James Bond is just a big-ass gun. Your gun isn't big enough. Here's a bigger gun, which is a cool gadget. I suppose. The thing about that is he's not called Q because he's not technically Q yet. I believe it was in Goldfinger. That's when Q was introduced as like a reoccurring character. I see. Yeah, you're right. Typically in a James Bond film, there's like this cheesy gadget scene. Cheesy, but sometimes fun gadget scene where Q gives him all these fun toys to play with and weapons to destroy people with. In this film, that's not present. It's just some dude arming him for the mission. Interesting fun fact about that actor that played the, the stand-in for what would eventually become Q later, that actor that played that role, his brother was considered to play James Bond before they hired Sean Connery. Oh, that's got to be such a nice Sunday dinner. Like, I can't believe they went with Sean Connery instead. Instead of me, hey, what's up, family? I just got a job in the new James Bond movie. <laughs> <laughs> James Bond is forced to turn in his Beretta in exchange for a Walther PPK, which is James Bond's iconic gun from the novels. Like, that's the gun he uses in the books. And I assume to people who know about guns, this scene is meaningful. But I'm just like, oh, yeah, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh, ooh, yeah, I understand. <laughs> I like the line that he's like, uh, this gun will shoot as if a brick going through a plate glass window. 
Like, damn. Before Bond goes to Jamaica, he stops by his apartment, and he runs into Sylvia Trench, the woman he played Baccarat with. Who's there? Wearing nothing but one of his shirts? <laughs> okay, yeah, she just broke into an MI6 agent's apartment. That's not suspicious at all. And James Bond obviously does the only logical thing. He just bangs her without asking any questions because he's a horny moron. Right. And nothing bad comes from it, but what the shit, James Bond? That was so suspicious. That's one thing that I'm going to explore more later in this review. But I'd argue that in this film... James Bond is a terrible secret agent. Oh yeah, he's a dipshit. Like, in this scene, this woman breaks into his apartment, takes his clothing, and then starts, what, playing golf? Yeah. He's told that he has to leave for Jamaica immediately, and then they start kissing, and he goes, well, almost immediately. And then it fades to him getting off the flight, and it's like, well, she could have been a spy, she could have been an assassin, and you never even cared? And there's just multiple instances of similar things like this. Like, dude, you have a license to kill by the British government. You're a secret agent, one of the greatest spies ever. And what, you're too busy dealing with your dick? Yeah. <laughs> you're and you're too busy is... thinking with your dick to, like, actually think about, oh, she might kill me. But I know she doesn't, but still, fuck. And the thing is, James Bond is actually pretty smart in this film. Yeah. He doesn't actually win a lot of things through just being a big buff guy. He outsmarts villains, except for when it comes to girls. He is just girl crazy. Oh, yeah. Speaking of outsmarting people, James Bond lands in Jamaica, and there's a chauffeur waiting for him. And that makes him suspicious, so he just sneaks away for a moment and calls MI6 and finds out, no, they didn't send a chauffeur because he doesn't like chauffeurs. The chauffeur is a trap. And James gets in the car with the chauffeur and another car starts chasing them and he gets the chauffeur to pull off the road and then pulls out a gun on the chauffeur because he knows the chauffeur is bad and interrogates him. And the chauffeur just eats some cyanide because, you know, gotta be difficult. Exactly. I mean, come on, dude. Come on, be a professional here. That scene was kind of strange because it's set up like, okay, he's being followed by some people, but his driver also you can't be trusted. And then he has the driver pull over to the side so that they can escape them. And then he pulls out a gun and then the driver goes for the gun, but then James Bond just beats the shit out of him. And that's really the first, I wouldn't even call it an action scene, because he's just kind of beating this dude up. Because there's not very much action in this movie in general, you know? That's one of the things that struck me is because of all the James Bond movies that I've seen thus far, I would definitely describe them all as action films. But not this one. This one is more so a thriller. And whether or not it succeeds at doing that, the, the strengths and weaknesses of how it executed that we'll get into later. But I don't know, there's just, it's not an action franchise yet. And I think from what I understand, as this film gets sequels, it will definitely start becoming more so that. But um, yeah, he just beats up this dude. And again, you're questioning this guy and this guy says, hey, can you hand me my cigarettes? And he goes... Yeah, sure, why not? Hands him a cigarette. There could be poison in those. I don't know, there could be a like a switchblade in there. I don't know, but he just hands him the box. The dude bites down on the cigarette. Again, worst secret agent ever, James Bond. Yeah. And then James Bond rolls up to the hotel with the dead body in the back seat. Oh, right, yeah. It's a good thing he has that cool license to kill, because otherwise this man would be in jail. Oh, yeah. Wait. I mean, the... Wait, a license to kill isn't a license that you show people. It's just right. he's allowed by MI6. <laughs> like, yeah. he doesn't have identification. He just says, don't worry, I'm MI6. I'm allowed to create these bodies. I'm sure if, like, he gets arrested or anything, they'll get into contact with him. But no, it's, like, not an actual license. Well, interestingly enough, there was, uh, I believe, the second Timothy Dalton James Bond film was entitled License to Kill. The story was about James Bond goes on a revenge mission against this crime gang that killed a friend of his, and MI6 revokes his license to kill. 
That'd be an interesting plot. Well, maybe we'll watch it sometime. Who yeah. knows? I think we should watch all the Bond movies. All mm. 25 of them. Yeah, It'll it might take, take a couple a few years. years. Definitely going to take a couple years, but I don't know. I'd be down for that. But anyway, he just rolls up to the hotel, goes to the concierge or whoever is at the front. And he goes, make sure he doesn't get away. And the guy like straight up is like, holy shit, is he dead? And he just walks into the fucking hotel as if it's nothing. So James Bond starts doing his investigation. He finds out that Strangways, the MI6 agent who was mysteriously killed, was due doing a lot of research into the island because for some reason NASA's rockets are crashing and they think that it's because of radio signals coming from Jamaica. He also meets a CIA agent named Felix Leiter who does absolutely nothing in this film. Boring. Stupid as shit. I mean, yeah. Like, literally, he does nothing. I mean, yeah. Felix does things in other James Bond movies, right? Yes, I know he's absolutely. a recurring character. Yes, absolutely. I believe he's played by Jeffrey Wright. Yeah, he's played by Jeffrey Wright in Casino Royale, Quantum of Solace, and he's going to be in No Time to Die. Jeffrey Wright is playing Commissioner Gordon in the next Batman film. Hmm. So, yes, he is very useful. And I'm sure that, because he's a character from the novels, obviously, and he is very important to the James Bond story. It's just in this film, he does nothing. Yeah. And it's not that big of a deal because at the end of the day, he's not even really a much of a part of the movie anyway, but it's like he's set up as like the equivalent of James Bond in the CIA and he does nothing. Fortunately, Bond does find a cooler ally, this guy named Quirrell, who is a boatman. But what's the word for that? Boatman? That's the word, right? Yeah. Man who drives boats. He sails people around in Jamaica and the Cayman Islands and was a friend with Strangways who helped him out. Although when Bond first meets Quirrell, they get into a little scuffle. Mm -hmm. I will say that's another thing that struck me upon watching this movie is if you're interested in watching it, be prepared. There are many racial stereotypes and a lot of ethnic makeup being worn. There's a lot of yellow face present in this film. White actors playing Asian characters. The character of Quarrel is a very blatant Jamaican stereotype. Though he is useful in the film, it's a very much so a product of the 1960s. Yeah, it was good for 1962. Maybe the subservience and the carrying around Bond's shoes and the cowardice maybe wouldn't be present in 2020. I do think in many ways it does detract from the film for me. And if you do plan on watching it, just be aware that is going to be present in the film. In this film, James Bond more so acts like a detective rather than a secret agent because the first like hour of this film is mostly just him sort of leisurely strolling around Jamaica gathering leads, investigating the death of 006. James Bond in Dr. No is more of a detective than a secret agent because he's terrible at being a secret agent and the pieces of this puzzle of the mystery that he's trying to solve are really fucking easy. He's like, oh, where did you go? Oh, we went everywhere except this one place. What's that one place? I don't know. No one goes there. Let's check that out. More specifically, James finds out that Strangways was hanging out with a geologist named... Uh, Professor Dent. Professor Dent. Yes, that was his name. Took me a second to scroll back down to the cast. <laughs> James takes some samples that Strangways had collected to Dent for analysis. And Dent says, oh, these are just iron and pyrite. They're nothing. Even though James, with his cool new gadget that was new in the 60s, a giant ass Geiger counter, knows that they're actually radioactive. So Dent is evil. He goes to visit Dr. No on Crab Key, which is where no one goes. Uh, where yeah, this, this is... Dent, by the way, just yes, not yes. to be confusing. 
Quarrel earlier warned James Bond against going to Crab Key because no one returns there alive and allegedly there's a dragon there. Dent goes to Crab Key where there's a giant base there that seemingly on the outside is nothing but on the inside is a villain, supervillain's evil lair and the lair belongs to the mysterious Dr. No who we also learned about in a scene in which Bond, Felix, and Quarrel are sitting like in a nightclub or wherever. They're talking and then a woman takes a photograph of them. They grab her, interrogate her, destroy her film. And crazy thing is, I was watching it like, what the fuck? She, what did she grab? Did she have like a light bulb or something? Some glass thing that she breaks on the table and cuts Quarrel's face open. Poor Quarrel. He doesn't bat an eye. He just grabs his face, looks at his hand covered in blood, and goes, you want me to break her hand, James? And he's like, no, I'll let her go. Yeah. I'm like, wow. This is a weird scene. It was a weird scene. But in that scene, he learns that no one goes to Crab Key because it's owned by a Chinese recluse billionaire by the name of Dr. No, who, as we learned in the opening scene, MI6 has information on. Yeah. You briefly mentioned it, but got distracted with the breaking arm scene. Dent goes to Dr. No's base, and it's actually a creepy scene of No talking from the darkness to Dent in this ominous, echoing voice. And he's not like that in any other scene, which is a shame because he's creepy in that scene. Yeah. But anyway, Dr. No tells Dent to kill James Bond with a tarantula. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> so... This assassination scene, James goes back to his apartment. He's going to get a drink of vodka. He sniffs it. Oh, this is poison. Just sets it down on the counter and gets out another bottle and drinks it because worst secret agent ever. He then just goes to bed and oh no, a tarantula that's going to kill me. Except... Tarantulas aren't actually all that poisonous. You do know that, right, James? Does Dr. No not know that? The venom in a tarantula bite is less than the venom in a honeybee sting. And true, like, honeybees, it hurts, but it's no more, it's not really that dangerous to you unless you have an allergy towards it. And I highly doubt that James Bond has a tarantula bite allergy. You know? Well, maybe he does because he freaks the fuck out. Yeah. <laughs> this badass secret agent scared of non-poisonous spiders. Exactly. Well, not poisonous, but not... Well, actually, they would be venomous if we're being literal. Interesting thing about the filming of that scene, Sean Connery was terrified of spiders. And if you look closely, the way it's shot... The fear on Sean Connery's face. Oh boy, that was real. Interesting thing though, whenever it shows Sean Connery's face and the tarantula on him, if you look closely, the tarantula isn't exactly walking on James Bond's arm because they had a sheet of plexiglass that separated Sean Connery from the spider because Connery was so deathly afraid of that non-venomous spider. <laughs> yeah. He needed the glass to separate them. And any footage of a uh, close-up of the tarantula on Bond's arm, that isn't Sean Connery. That's his stuntman who was in the barrel gun scene I mentioned earlier. And even that stuntman said that that is one of, if not the scariest stunts he ever had to do in his career because a non-venomous spider was on his arm i get it i get it i personally don't have arachnophobia and i understand that there's going to be people in this world that have arachnophobia and i have to understand and respect that i do but i don't know it's not that big of a deal guys <laughs> honestly i'm fine with sean connor or even james bond being creeped up by tarantulas yeah same but seriously doctor no you moron that wouldn't have killed him they're not very dangerous not at all you gotta be bitten like a hundred times for it yeah to be dangerous anyway as james is going about his investigation he notices that miss tarot the secretary of one of the government guys he's working with is spying on him meaning that she's a double agent working for dr no and also she's played by a white actress which is like we said it's correct but the character is asian yeah yeah it's by the way bond goes on a date with this double agent who is trying to murder him 
and they go to her house and they bang because James Bond is really horny. Well, and before that, before that, on the way to her house, he oh god, is, I forgot he about has that. a tail. He's being tailed by another car and he's able to shake them off and they get driven off a cliff into a blazing inferno. And when one of the employees nearby asks Bond, what 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 happened? Bond goes, they must have been on their way to a funeral. Nice quip, but Dude, you just killed, like, three people. But yeah, though, James Bond, he has sex with the double agent working against him. He does actually have some cops take her away. And then, that night, Dent comes to kill James Bond. And he, like, shoots at the bed, but it's actually pillows. And then Bond comes out from the shadows and points his gun at Dent and, like, interrogates him. And also, there's... A famous line that's also a dumb line. Dent like threatens Bond with his gun and Bond says, That's a Smith and Wesson and you've had your six. Except if you actually look at it, it's not a Smith and Wesson. It's a different type of gun that holds more than six bullets. Oops. Uh oh, prop department. That scene, again, goes to show for me how terrible of a secret agent James Bond is. He's interrogating this guy. He's like, he's like, tell me who you're working for. And the guy goes, it doesn't matter. When you find out who he is, you'll already be dead. So he's interrogating this guy. He has him at gunpoint. He has the high ground, metaphorically. And then Dent grabs his gun that Bond knows is empty. And then he fires it and is like, you've already had your six. So what does James Bond continue doing? Does he continue to interrogate the prisoner for much needed information? No. He kills him then and there after giving that badass but kind of stupid line. Like, again, what are you doing, Bond? You're supposed to be the world's greatest secret agent, and you're killing the one lead you possibly have to defeating a supervillain? Worst secret agent ever. I mean, come hey, on. Hey, in Bond's defense, then he comes up with a brilliant plan. He goes to the mysterious island that he's not supposed to go to. Like, seriously, all that early stuff in the film, it was very important because otherwise James wouldn't know that he needed to go to the island that he was told to go to at the very start of the film. Quarrel finally gathers up the courage to take Bond there to the part of the island that he was clearly supposed to go all along. They, under cover of darkness, make it to that part of the island. They kind of wait there until daylight. It was up until this point that I was very much so like, this is completely different from the tone and style and story of James Bond that I'm particularly familiar with the tropes of. But it was particularly around this point, you know, an hour and a half into the movie that it really started to pick up and become like the James Bond story we all know and love, particularly with the introduction of femme fatale Honey Rider, played by Ursula Andress. Also, all her dialogue, and the dialogue of basically every woman in this movie for some reason, is done by Nikki Van Der Zyl. I don't know why all the women had to be voiced by the same woman. Is James Bond just attracted to that one voice actress? Is that <sighs> it? I don't even know. <laughs> Probably. Honey Rider, obviously, she is extremely attractive. Yeah, you get the iconic coming out of the ocean in the bikini scene, but... Her character is a little bit cartoony as we go in. She's very intelligent, but she's self-educated as we eventually learn. Her demeanor is very childlike on purpose. So, I don't know. It's just her character is very cartoony. She is telling the story about how she killed the man who sexually assaulted her with a black widow spider. But then she's also like, my dad died. I think he was killed by Dr. No. And it's just, I don't know, I just think it's really cartoony and not very well fleshed out. You know what the problem with Honey Rider is? Hmm. She is utterly irrelevant to this film's plot, aside from being a girl for James Bond to make out with at the end. Yes. Like, they do... Try to give her character with mentioning some dark things in her backstory, the sexual assault thing and her father's murder. But neither of those things are ever mentioned again after she brings them up talking to the strange man she just ran into. I don't like Honey Rider. She's a pointless damsel in distress character. Again, very outdated stereotypes in this film. She's on the seashore collecting seashells. <laughs> 
<laughs> she's singing um i forget the song but it, the song acts kind of like a theme song for the movie and james bond sings it as he's walking up to her to introduce himself and that is the only time james bond ever sings in this in the entire franchise from what i understand at least sean connery i believe that's the only time sean connery sings in this franchise and it's not that great they meet some of the security guards of crab key they show up and tell everyone to come out with their hands up you know the whole nine yards they all duck and hide the security guards shoot at them but they miss and they say all right fine we're coming back later literally like that like not the greatest well-written dialogue they bring honey with them for some reason James, Quarrel, and Honey, they all go running into the jungle, basically looking for a safe place to plan their next move. While they're running through the jungle, they get tracked down by dogs, so they hide underwater. All the guards go away, except for one. James Bond kills the one remaining guard. It was kind of an interesting scene at first, because I believe Honey said, like, did you kill him? And Bond was like, yeah, I had to. So that, again, would really go into this idea of, like, what are the ethics of what James James Bond does. But the immediate next scene is Honey telling James that she killed someone before. It just doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. You know? you know, it's interesting. I actually, I did a bit of reading on this film after I watched it. Apparently, two of the major times when James kills someone in this movie, when he shoots Dent and when he knifes that guard in front of Honey, neither of those were in the book and they were added to the movie to make James look cool. Oh, okay. But still, killing Dent was kind of dumb. Even if he wasn't going to give Bond any more information, what the fuck does killing him accomplish? So throughout their journeys through the island, Honey and Quirrell tell James about the local legends, about how there's a dragon on the island. And then later that night, they run into the dragon, which is Just a, a tank, flame. Right? Yeah, it's a tank. I mean, it has some like teeth painted on it and flamethrowers, but it's a dra- It's not a dragon. Quirrell and Honey are idiots. Also, yeah. Quirrell dies anticlimactically because- I was actually really disappointed by that. He was set up as a pretty important part to the story. And then he, he the... just gets dunked in fire. Yeah, he was a cooler <laughs> character than Honey Rider. More useful anyway. Yeah. But anyway, James and Honey get captured and brought into Dr. No's base. And as they're being brought in, all the guards like freak out like, Oh no, you're covered in radioactive stuff because you were out in the swamp. Which, first off, can we talk about how bad of a nuclear facility this place is? Yes. Like, I'm sorry, you're dumping the waste in the swamp right next to your base? That's not smart. No, not at all. And as it goes on, this is a very poorly run nuclear facility, but James and Honey are decontaminated. In a really long, overdrawn scene, by the way. That decontamination went on way too long, I thought. They're taken into the secret mountain base to this very nice hotel room in it. I'd just like to say for a moment, best thing in this movie, the set design of Dr. No's Lair. It is yes. cool. It is intricate, fancy, Awfully ridiculously expensive for a temporary base, but it is cool, and I like it. Yeah, it was really well done. But, uh, yeah, that dragon, that was a really dumb plot point. It's like, no, it's, it's, it's just a tank. Yeah, sure, it has teeth painted on it, and it spits fire, but that just... Fuck you. <laughs> but yeah, they get decontaminated. They're shown to their hotel room. And I actually thought it was very interesting, the sort of shift in tone when it, uh, they're being brought into this evil mastermind's lair. And then out of nowhere, these nurses show up and they're like, here, we'll take you to your rooms and you can have breakfast there and have dinner with Dr. No pretty soon. And I'm a fan of when the villains are so confident that they're going to succeed, that they're willing to give something back to the heroes this is a really weird obscure thing but it was something that i thought of have you ever seen the movie uh sherlock holmes a game of shadows i have not no there was a part towards the end of the second act beginning of the third act in that where the villain's plot is he's gonna try and start world war one so that he can fund both sides of the war with all the weapons they can buy and he'll become the richest man alive essentially there's a part where sherlock is investigating the factory 
that all these guns are being made off of. However, one of the minor villains finds him and they have a little bit of a chat. One of the minor villains opens up one of the crates and shows him all these automatic pistols. The reason why I bring it up is because in that scene, in the conversation, the villain takes one of the loaded guns and hands it to Sherlock Holmes. And the movie as a whole isn't that great, but that one moment I thought was pretty well done, pretty powerful, because he's like, look, there's nothing you can do to stop me, so here you go. Here's this weapon that you could use to kill me, but you're not going to. Stuff like that I think is super cool, especially in this film, like when you get into this evil scientist's lair and turns out it's this really well-designed artistic hotel. There are these smiling ladies that are like, oh yes, I'll show you to your room and you can eat. And my point is I like the shift in tone there. Yeah, I like villains having sort of friendly but sinister because of their arrogance relationships with the hero. And this film kind of does that with Dr. No later on. Just one more moment, like, James Bond being a dumbass. Remember, earlier in the film, he knows that Dr. No tried to poison him. James Bond gets into this hotel room and, Ooh, Dr. No left some coffee for me. I'm gonna drink it, glug, glug, glug. Oh no, sleeping pills. Faint. You Worst fucking secret. moron. Worst secret agent ever, I'm telling you. <laughs> oh my god, you freaking idiot. Like, he was remarkably calm throughout this entire process. Like, being captured, being taken, decontaminated, blasted with chemicals, taken to this room, this really weird room inside a mountain. It's like, he was remarkably, not even, like, confident with himself. Like, he just seemed, like, really stone-faced and almost bored. I mean, to be fair, he's James Bond. This shit happens every goddamn week. Yeah, him. very true. Again, he just never thought, never occurred to him, never occurred to him to think, oh, maybe this food is poisoned. Maybe they're trying to kill me. <laughs> it's so stupid. Yeah, and then, and then after that, they wake up and just start getting dressed to have dinner with Dr. No. Honestly, what did Dr. No get for giving James Bond knockout coffee except for to make him look like a dipshit to the audience? There was one scene when he passed out. It cut to him. Apparently, Dr. No's henchman moved him to his bed. I I guess, but you could have just let him walk himself to bed. He's probably tired after all the dragon fighting. Yeah. While Bond is sleeping, Dr. No walks in and you don't see his face. You just see him walking in and you see his black gloves or what you assume are his gloves and... He just kind of stands over James Bond menacingly, but that really doesn't achieve much either. You could, like you said, have the exact same established by Sean Connery walking to bed and mm -hmm. Dr. No watches him on a security camera or something. Yeah, James Bond's a freaking idiot, but Dr. No, he ain't that bright either. No, not at all. But yeah, you're right. That really served no purpose. Yeah, that's weird. And then they just wake up and get dressed as if nothing happened. Yeah. And they go to dinner with the supervillain, Dr. No. Let's talk about Dr. No. He's not actually Chinese, just getting that out of the way. They do explain later on in their conversation he's half Chinese, half German. But still, he's played by a fully white man. Still offensive. Still yellow face, my guy. I thought Dr. No, like his character, the idea of his character, his presence when he was on screen, I thought he was a pretty cool villain. Yeah, he's all right. His whole thing is he used to be like the accountant for like a Chinese crime organization, but faked his death and stole like $10 million from them. And in 1962, 10 million was a lot more than it is today. Yeah, for instance, this film cost $1 million to make. You could make 10 of this with what Dr. No stole. Dr. No, he is a Chinese scientist who is played, like we said, by a Jewish man. He knows everything about James Bond. He's had his phones tapped. He's had him followed. He knows everything about him, even how he likes his martinis, shaken, not stirred. That iconic line. And again, James Bond drinks another drink. <laughs> he drinks another drink that Dr. No gives him because... <sighs> fucking idiot. 
Dr. No also has prosthetic hands, like robotic hands. He lost his hands in an accident doing his research that he's been doing in this base. And he has like these super strong metallic robot hands. And again, that's clearly old school James Bond here. That's something they don't do anymore, like giving the villains some interesting like physical augmentation. I think that's something that um, I think they should try to get back to doing with the future films in the franchise. Because I think that that offers some interesting possibilities like Dr. No having fake hands. He's able to crush stone in his fists. One of the villains from a few Bond movies, whose name I believe was Jaws, his essentially has like augmented skull so that like he can crush through anything with his teeth. You know, it's cheesy and stupid, but I'd argue that it's time for Bond to get a little bit more lighthearted. Yeah. We can get into that later when we discuss future movies in this franchise. So... Dr. No immediately sends away Honey Rider because she's a pointless character. And then he starts explaining his plan to James Bond. He works for an organization named Spectre, which shows up in a lot of James Bond movies. It's just this big evil organization that does various crimes. And Dr. No wants James to join Spectre and James says no. And that's why Dr. No's just been like letting him live. Although after James says no, he could probably just kill James Bond. Yeah, very true. I mean, he doesn't have his reason to keep him alive, but whatever. But also, for Spectre to show off the organization's power, Dr. No is going to sabotage the Mercury space missions and make all the rockets crash to make Spectre look powerful, I guess. I don't know. I feel like there's more efficient ways to do that. And to power his rocket messing up radios, he needs a giant nuclear reactor because I don't know. It's never really made clear what the end game of his plans are. Step one, make rocket crash. Step two, step three, profit question mark? It's a dumb plan. Personally, I didn't know that Dr. No had any connection to Spectre. He doesn't in the book is something I found out while researching this film. In the book, he works for the Russian government, and that's why he wants to mess up NASA. In this, he's with Spectre because... Let's be honest, the Cold War shit had already gone stale by 1962. And yet, despite that, the second film in this franchise, this movie's direct sequel is entitled From Russia With Love. So, you know, didn't stay away for too long. (laughs) You know, sometimes you gotta backtrack. For those of you listening that don't know what Spectre is, the Special Executive for Counterintelligence, Terrorism, Revenge, and Extortion, which is kind of a stupid name, but Spectre is cool. Spectre and its leader, Ernest Blofeld, are to James Bond what Red Skull and Hydra are to Captain America. They're mortal enemies. And it was cool for me, who had no idea that this was going to be in the movie, to have been revealed. I don't know, that was a cool thing. I'm glad I wasn't spoiled. The inclusion of Spectre. I thought that that was a pleasant surprise, despite the fact that a white man is portraying an Asian man who's barely in this movie and a wasted potential for a character is the one that's saying it. So, you know, it's a bit of a mixed bag. (laughs) so after bond rejects his join our evil organization offer dr no just puts bond in prison and bond breaks out by going through the strangest vent ever first off massive vent in the prison cell which is a bit of security breach but this vent like heats up in points and there's floods of water who designed this vent i know from what i read that it's a fake vent that's used to mess with James Bond in the book, but that's not in this. It's just the weird vent. First off, the thing that struck me, the fact that the vent is big enough to fit James Bond, a couple people is like, that struck me. But the first thing that struck me was he tries to sneak into the vent, but it shocks him because there's an electric current there. So he takes off his shoes and he uses them to knock off the very flimsy cover to that vent. He just kind of smacks it a little bit with his hand in his shoe and the vent just opens up. 
because I don't know, it makes a lot of sense the fact that in the books it's a fake vent, but still, it's like in this one. I don't know, I feel like if you push on it a little too hard, that the cover to that vent would have come off. And then he's in that vent and water is rushing down. How the fuck is water rushing down in an air vent? I don't know. But Bond just kind of grabs on to the edges of the vent, tries to hold on as the water tries to flush him out. But here's my thing. Again, James Bond, you are the worst secret agent because you're in a nuclear testing facility. Oh my god, yes! Shit, that's probably wastewater. James Bond has cancer now. Yeah, for all you know, that could be nuclear waste. And you did nothing but let it happen to you. How are you a double O agent if you are this incompetent? How do you sleep with a woman that breaks into your house to have sex with you and puts on your clothes? How do you drink coffee that is most definitely poisoned and then just, eh, whatever, it's probably fine. How do you let yourself get irradiated by toxic waste? God, he is so incompetent in this. So he goes through the vent, he steals a science suit from a guard and goes into the main control room and then just turns one lever a bit too far to the right, which causes the entire nuclear reactor to melt down. Bit of an oversight, Dr. No, just saying. He and Dr. No get into a fight. James kicks No into the, like, water that they use to cool the rods, and No is boiled alive. He, like, tries to climb out, but his robot hands don't get good traction. Overall, I'd say Dr. No, had he been in the movie more, had they fleshed out his character, I do think he could have been a great villain. It's just, he's barely in this. He doesn't come in until like 20 minutes left in the movie. And then the only thing that he's involved in is a climax in which all James Bond does is steal a hazmat suit, pull a lever, and punch him into the water. That's all that happens. Dr. No is just kind of okay. One last, and I swear this is the last time we're going to make fun of James Bond for being a moron, but this is also the biggest thing he does. So James Bond really just caused a massive nuclear meltdown right next to Jamaica. Like, he's giving so many people cancer by that. Holy shit, it's within a few hours of boat from a populated city. People live there, they fish there. You just killed so many people with that meltdown, Bond. What the shit? But it was a cool explosion, so it's okay. <laughs> no, it's really not. It's yeah, really but not. No, you cost your noble! You freaking moron! Uh, yeah. And they try to cover that up with him finding Honey, who's being kept prisoner. They get onto a boat and somehow make it to safety before the blast. While knowing full well that they just detonated a nuclear bomb that's going to kill a large portion of Jamaica. And, I mean, it's not a big explosion, but the radiation is the thing yeah. that's in the water. They're driving the boat away. It, it runs out of gas. So what do they do? Knowing full well they are out at sea, probably going to die of dehydration. They just detonated a nuclear bomb that's going to give lots of people cancer, especially in a part of the world where they can't afford very good medical care. I mean, I don't know. I don't know much about Jamaica's medical science. I don't know. Well, I can tell you this about Jamaica's medical care. It probably isn't up to the snuff of curing everyone of cancer. Very true. I don't think anyone, any country's medical services could handle James Bond causing fucking Chernobyl. But the point is, James Bond knowing full well that they are out lost at sea, probably gonna die of dehydration, just caused Chernobyl. What did they do? Eh, we won. We stopped the bad guy. Let's bang. And they yeah. start bang. <laughs> they start and I mean, banging you can see them. Felix coming up with his ship to rescue them. Felix and the CIA show up and they're like, hey, you need a tow? Then they start being towed by the big CIA boat. But then Bond loosens up the rope, gets them untied. As the CIA boat continues without them, they just continue banging. The end. <laughs> the end of the movie. Stop kissing the girl. The boat is leaving you behind. This entire area is poison. The end. You're the worst secret agent ever, James Bond. The parodies of you are more competent than you. Sterling Archer is more competent than you. Shit, Austin Powers is more competent than this dipshit. Exactly. I mean, come on. <laughs> so, 
that's the film. Riley, did you like this film? Because I'm going to be honest, I yeah, I didn't really like it that much. It was uh, just kind of okay. Yeah, I liked it. I mean, obviously, racial and gender stereotypes aside, the film is a lot different than what I was expecting. I mean, the more and more I think about it, the less I do like it. Like you mentioned earlier, this film was on a $1 million budget. I feel like even for what would be an action movie at the time, that's still not a whole lot of money. I mean, I guess it was the 60s, so I don't know. This movie is, it's not an action movie. It's a thriller. But when it comes to all the elements of the thriller, like the story, the writing, the characterization, the acting, all that, this is very much so a B-movie in disguise. Like, when you think of James Bond, especially at this time, when he got started, James Bond franchise is like the king of the action spy thriller genre. Like, he pioneered his own genre and was for decades the only franchise of note within that genre now recently there's been uh other franchises so many franchises like jason Bourne, endless franchises for the longest time james bond was the only one really worth noting up until the jason Bourne franchise the kingsman franchise stuff like that and a shit ton of other ripoffs of the bond movies but and it comes to the writing, directing, acting. It's just a B-movie, you know? It's just some cheap thriller. The beginning of a franchise that would become, like, the best spy action thriller ever made. Like, there's a reason why we're getting James Bond number 25. It's because something is working. That said, I do think this one is probably one of the weaker that I've seen That said, I've seen what are arguably the best ones. This and Quantum of Solace are definitely the weaker of the franchise that I've seen. And from what I've heard, Quantum of Solace is just, in general, the worst one. So here's the thing about, really, media in general. When you do something that's new and interesting and exciting, it's great at the time, it's not great 60 years later. I can understand why this film had such a big impact and is so beloved. This codified spy films. So many of the tropes we associate with the genre originated in this film. But the problem with that is, looking at it from a modern perspective, there's little in this film that hasn't been replicated or parodied a thousand times. It just kind of feels dull. And while other James Bond movies either raise the stakes through the roof with cool action scenes and over-the-top villains or fall into their own ridiculousness to the point of being a self-parody, this one just kind of comes across as a bit dull, you know? Yeah, I absolutely agree. James Bond is an idiot, not the greatest character. From what I understand in the books, James Bond is a very dark, depressed person who has a very tragic past but covers it up with violence womanizing and alcoholism and he struggles with the idea of whether or not what he is doing is the right thing whether or not killing people is the way to go about it but in this one he's just he's just some horny dude who makes a lot of really obvious mistakes Honey Ryder is extremely beautiful. Ursula Andress was gorgeous at the time. Yeah, she's but, pretty, but her character is pointless. Yes, exactly. Pointless, shitty, weird, cartoony. Felix Leiter is boring as shit. Even Dr. No, who honestly is probably the most interesting character in this movie, he's not great. He's just something interesting. He's barely in it and doesn't do much in the scenes that feature him. This is very much so Bond light. This was before the franchise like found its stride. You know, all those tropes that you mentioned earlier, Casey, those really didn't start until the third entry into this franchise, which is Goldfinger. Mm. That was like when those big gadget scenes, that's when Q came in and he's given all these crazy gadgets the women with double entendre names like pussy galore and shit like that that's when all that started so it was it took a few films for this franchise to like actually find its stride and become as iconic as it has become but as for this one it's just a cheap thriller with poorly written characters the directing is fine nothing really notable the writing 
not much there either. They mostly use on-location shooting. I believe they filmed a lot in Jamaica. The scenery looks beautiful. Like that part where they're running through the jungle, right when they're being tracked down by the dogs. Like that looked beautiful. That's a place I'd love to just visit one day. But the movie as a whole, like the first hour is so boring. There's not much action. Not even much happens. It's just Bond is an idiot and he sleeps with a bunch of women. That's really it. Or a lot of things do happen it's just nothing very interesting yeah so on a scale of one to ten how would you rate this film uh, you know after everything i've said the first half of this movie is just james bond leisurely strolling through jamaica a lot of racial stereotypes a lot of gender stereotypes james bond is an idiot they wasted a perfectly good villain Though it did set up what would be arguably the most persistent, longest lasting cinema franchise in history, the James Bond franchise. Mm -hmm. In terms of its impact, without this film, we would not have a lot of the other more iconic, beloved James Bond movies. That said, as for this film, I'm probably going to give it like a four and a half, let's say. Don't really have much interest in watching it again, apart from the racial stereotypes. Thought it was kind of harmless, but then you realize just how many racial stereotypes there are, and you're like, okay. I'm glad I saw it, but overall, this I'll give it a four and a half. It was just boring. Right. I'm going to get raked over the coals for saying this, but I'm going to give this film like a seven. I don't know. Maybe we're spoiled by modern action movies. We are spoiled by modern action movies, but it just failed to grab me, you know? Right. There's more to an action movie than good action. There's story, there's characters. When we reviewed Die Hard, that movie is incredibly well written, has great characters, a lot of great development, and it's more than just like the really well done stunts and action. There's more to an action movie than just the action. This film does not have that, and arguably it doesn't even have the action. Yeah. Yeah, it's just really nothing, this movie. Again, apart from the yellow face... I wasn't offended by it. I just kind of felt nothing towards most of it, you know? Yeah, it's just, yeah. Riley, where can they find you? You can all find me on YouTube at Riley Thorpe, where you can check out all of my latest horror and comedy short films. You can also find me on TikTok and Instagram at Riley James Thorpe, all one word. Give me a follow there where you can get updated on all the projects that are in my life. And updates into when new episodes of this show are released. You can find me on Twitter at Jarms Casey, J A R M E S C A S C Y. You can find just basically all the work I do linked on CaseyJarms.wordpress.com. Uh, we'll be back next week, unless we get distracted by all damn pretty girls who have the same voice. God, I wish that would happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, stop being horny on me. Next week, we're reviewing. The first X-Men movie. Yeah, mutants. I don't know. I'm not an X-Men guy. I've... Shit, I've never actually seen the first X-Men movie. I, I've... What have I seen? I've seen First Class. I've seen both Deadpools. I've seen Logan. Oh, and I've seen Apocalypse, which is the best one. I... <laughs> I am not an X-Men guy. You're an X-Men guy, right? Yeah. Yeah, I am. Okay, cool. I know that since Disney bought Fox and they're going to be rebooting the X-Men, I don't know, probably in like 15 years, <laughs> whenever we'll get the X-Men. Oh, God, but, uh, way less than 15. I don't know. The dollar signs, they see them. I know the this franchise that we're going to start reviewing, it really towards the end went downhill with Dark Phoenix and New Mutants. But <laughs> yes, with Dark Phoenix. That's when the downhill spiral started. You're right, you're right. There's a lot wrong with this franchise, and at the end of the day, it really doesn't mean anything because Disney's going to reboot it anyway, and it's going to be a part of the MCU. But that said, I'm glad that we are going to have the opportunity to review the movie so that we just kind of give our takes on it before it's lost forever. So next week, X-Men. Sweet. As always, I'm Casey Jarms. And I'm Riley Thorpe. And hey, it's just a movie. Don't lose your head about it, especially not to a ladder. 